Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ms. Kirkland, on this uh, issue of slots. Do you know if uh, how DOT arrived at their conclusion about the previous U.S. Air Delta uh, that they could own 55 percent? I think it's 55.6 percent of the slots at Reagan after their swap swap with um, Delta. And uh, did and did under that for, answer that question first? Sorry. Uh, sorry, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, yes, uh, under the slot swap transaction that was proposed to us by Delta and uh, U.S. Airways, we took a careful look at uh, what the outcomes would be both at LaGuardia and at DCA. And in doing an analysis, uh, we came up uh, with the conclusion that it would be appropriate for um, U.S. Airways and Delta to, to divest of a certain amount of slots, we uh, we put them up for uh, auction, and uh, they were uh, they were uh, obtained uh, uh, by JetBlue at the time. So at the time, we we made the uh, conclusion or we made the judgment that 55.6 percent, uh, I believe that was the number, uh, uh, was that we should not it should not go higher at that time. And did you con did DOJ at that time consider um, Dulles or, or Baltimore as substitutes for consumers, or that that was separate? We took a look at all three markets, and there is not perfect substitutability between all three markets. Uh, different passengers want different things um, from particular markets. For example, uh, at DCA, you've got uh, passengers who are interested in being close into the capital, the ease of getting to the capital. You also have uh, passengers that live close to DCA, so there is not a perfect substitutability between all three uh, markets, all, and, all three uh, and, airports. And, and Mr. Kennedy, prior to the merger announcement, um, what, what were the American slots used for at Reagan? Were they large or medium size, um, you know, airport pairings? We serve a number of, of uh, airports out of um, uh, out of Reagan. And um, not as many small and medium-sized cities as U.S. Air because of, of they have more slots than we do. But we serve a number of, of a number of airports. I don't know the exact number. Okay, if you could get that information, I, we can do that. Yes, for us, I would appreciate it. And Mr. Lioka, I, I certainly understand your uh, focus and certainly your frustration with what's transpired in the aviation uh, in the airline industry. And you bring up a very very important point. I mean, there's probably nobody more frustrated by. Uh, airlines dumping uh, employee pensions at the PCBG only to have employees uh, greatly wiped out for lifetime of earnings. So I understand um, your your frustration and your concern. Mr. Kennedy has said um, that in this case that they are not dumping this at the doorstep of the PCGB, which would seem to be good news. Am I misunderstanding something here? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm not talking about dumping things on the PG, um, PCGB. I was talking more about um, a specific situation that is within the American Airlines uh, flight attendant union where the uh, TWA flight attendants were stapled to the bottom of the list. The date of and the that's where, uh, the date of hire issue. And that's something which um, I've been, for years I've had friends who, who went through that and I just think it's something which needs to be fixed. And I applaud, by the way, um, uh, American Airlines and U.S. Airways for not choosing to dump everything on the government and find a way to work it out. I was very glad to see that happen. And that wasn't their first choice, by the way, but it was eventually their arms were twisted and they ended up doing it. Well, I, I uh, from what I understand today, also think that that is good news. Uh, I do think the date and service issue does need to be fixed, and I do think that uh, we need to look at uh, this issue of how does airline consolidation impact uh, 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 pensions and pension obligations? But I also believe that when we had this discussion as it related to U.S. Air and Delta Airlines, there were a lot of pilots in the back of the room, and they were not for the merger. And my understanding is there are a lot of pilots here today, and they are for the merger. So I just want to understand that point, too, and if Mr. Parker or Kennedy or Mr. Leoka want to comment on that. Um, Yes, I was here for that hearing as well, um, as you recall. Um, 
So yeah, no, the, the, the distinction, of course, is um, in that case, the employees of Delta Airlines very much wanted to remain independent. And the distinction here is the employees of American and the employees of US Airways understand that the best thing for them, uh, for their careers, for their, for their livelihood, is to have a carrier that can compete with the other large carriers that are out there, United, Delta, Southwest. And, and they fully acknowledge, they fully know and understand and have done their work to understand that uh, this is in their best interest and they can speak for themselves and they have um, and are very excited about this and we're excited to have their support. The good news from the, from the first round of questioning is in all the discussion of merger issues, the one thing that keeps popping up is slots. Uh, I think that's somewhat good news about the overall issue of the merger, but it might also not be so good news <laughs> as it relates to slots and so, or, the stickiness of that issue. And this is a very, very important issue to many of my colleagues, as you can see. Airports are tools for economic development. And if a community doesn't have air access, it's pretty hard to continue to grow the economic base. Uh, but Mr. Parker, when we were looking at the Modernization Act, the FAA bill, um, there were uh, US Airways sought to convert 100 existing slots that you had with inside the perimeter and switch them to outside the perimeter. So you basically wanted to take DCA slots and say, okay, now let's service, you know, these farther destinations in the West. And at the time, a lot of my colleagues raised questions saying, oh my gosh, you're going to do now what you're suggesting might happen. You basically people said, well, wait a minute, you'll, you'll start servicing, you know, San Diego or someplace else and you'll get rid of the Madison, Wisconsin flight or what have you. And at the time, uh, US Airways said, no, 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 we have the flexibility to use these flights for large hub service and small cities would not be impacted. That's what you told many people on this committee. So now it seems like you're advocating just the opposite. You're saying, oh, no, no, yes, if we have to divest, you know, we will, we will impact those, those hubs. And so I just want to make sure I'm understanding from you from what was previously said sure. what the difference is because um, I uh, think that there are other economic issues here about competition that DOJ has to look at right. larger than just you know the individual hub uh, airport issues but how much service should DCA be allowed to be concentrated under one carrier and what does that do to Im impacting price and availability? That's what I think the Department of Justice mm -hmm. should be looking at. So um, I guess, are you saying that you don't support the issue of a divestiture? It, it, as, a, as, in, as it relates to this merger? Yes. Yeah, we don't believe there's any reason we should be, there's no legal reason to be asked to divest. It's a policy issue and one that we think is bad policy. Uh, that is correct. Um, let me, if I can, you, you raised the perimeter rule issue in our-, in our Yeah, our, you, you had a different, I don't, right. it seems like it's a issue that was looking for a cause. It seems like you were, you know, you wanted before to basically switch out 100 slots and use them for long distance. And when somebody said, hey, you're gonna get rid of these small cities. You said, oh, no, no, we have enough flexibility. Now that somebody's saying, hey, give up some of these slots, you're saying, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't, because I will end up cutting the service to these essential areas. Yeah, thank you. And the answer to the question, in short, is, is what's the alternative? The reality is, uh, as we were, as it was, in relation to the perimeter rule, um, what we argued. So what, you were wrong before? No, I, I, let me explain, okay. please. Um, what our position was that we believe, and, and that there were, the, the DC would be better served with more flights outside the perimeter to provide more service to even more communities than exist today. Um, understand, of course, two things. One, uh, the desire not to increase capacity at Reagan, which is, again, fine by us. Um, if, that's, if that's what um, the law is going to be, that's fine. Um, the, but needing to stay within that constraint um, and also wanting to make sure we adapt, we, we were responsive to concerns from small and um, medium-sized communities uh, said and agreed that what we would like to do is see is in exchange for the ability to fly outside the perimeter to some larger communities, we would indeed divest from some larger markets. That's a different question when that's the alternative, to be able to add a flight outside the perimeter would you, die, would you give up one inside to a larger community? The answer to answer that when asked was yes. Now the different question, if you, ask, if you ask us, we have to take slots away from you, 
we are going to, because of some policy decision, decide to take away slots from U.S. combined airline. So your alternative now is you have to cancel something, not swap it for something. Um, the decision will be, as it should be, to, to, to cancel the routes that, are the, that produce the lowest amount of revenue for the airline, and those are small and medium-sized communities. So it's completely consistent to me. I, I, think, I think your conclusion is the right conclusion that anybody would do something that is in the interest of the business in getting rid of the less profitable route. But the reason why someone would look at divestiture is it, it's not some policy. It's about competition, and it's about too much concentration at DCA and what issues for the consumer are being left unprotected. So I don't know, Mr. Leoka, did you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, I've spent a lot of time on this slot issue, and I've, been, I've met with DOT. I've met I'm with not sure if you've spent more time than the, Senator Warner and I, but if you maybe, have, if you maybe have, not, we're but glad. <laughs> we're glad <laughs> We're glad to let you join our club, okay? <laughs> I'll be glad to join you. Okay. Um, we had, I've met with Susan Curlin's staff, I've talked with DOJ, and uh, we know that the Department of Justice was not happy with the, at least as I interpret it, not happy with DOT's uh, solution the last time. Uh, we have a situation where um, we just can't have competition when almost 70% of the uh, market is controlled by one air airline. And basically what US Air is doing is, even though they are altruistically covering and reaching out to all these small communities, they're doing it with very small aircraft. They have the smallest aircraft of any hub in America comes in and out of DC. Uh, also, I look at the DC slots as a national treasure. They're to bring people here to the nation's capital so that we can, uh, they can uh, inter interact with, with uh, here in the capital of the United States. And almost 40% of the people who fly in and out of DCA don't even stop here. They just change planes. And I don't, I'm sure that Mr. Um, Parker doesn't mean that he's going to eliminate all of the service because they still make money doing that. The service might move to Baltimore, it might move out to Dulles. Uh, let's say five years ago, that would have been a real problem. But today, we've got great connections between Baltimore and, and downtown. We have uh, Mark trains, we have uh, Amtrak trains, we've got buses to the Metro, and I'm someone who actually gets to take them all, or taking good old bus 5A out to Dulles from Roslyn, and soon we're gonna have the Silver Line. So a lot of the, the problems that we used to have in terms of you had to be going in and out of DCA, otherwise it was too inconvenient, uh, are leaving. What we need to do now is increase the number of people being able to come into our nation's capital and come here and visit here, spend their money here, and learn about our government. And that's where I think that um, moving the slots around will really be important. And uh, if the merger has to go through, this is a remedy. And there should be other remedies because this only covers one little tiny pocket of it. Mr. Leoka, I wanted to continue because your analysis of that there are U.S. Airways and American overlap on 12 nonstop routes, and for seven of these cities, there are no other nonstop competitors. So Department of Justice will have to look at these competitive overlaps and you know, understand this horizontal merger guideline. But you're, you refer in your study, 761 routes between domestic airports overlap between US and American, and additionally, 40% of routes face daily competition from U.S. Airways and 30% from U.S. Airways and American. Okay, so can you explain your study and if you're, you're saying that there is a better way to look at this issue on you know, potential merger impacts, market by market or some well, other thing? the way you Mr. have Dilling to look- And Dr. Dillingham, I want you to comment on that as well. Right, uh, the way we need to look at it is the whole concept of a hub airline or a hub system is a system is a system that connects. You fly into the hub, you fly out of the hub. That's the whole creation of it. And so, in order, if you look at a merger, only looking at the number of nonstop, um, uh, direct, you know, con you know, straight flights, and there's only 12 of them, that's not the good way to look at it. You have to look at how connecting flights uh, compete. And that's what really works. If you're flying from Seattle to Austin, Texas, you, you will go Seattle to Dallas to Austin, or you go Seattle to Phoenix to Austin. But your 
if you go into Kayak and you look it up on Expedia, you go to your travel agency, you're going to get a price. And those, those airlines compete like mad with each other right now. That competition is going to disappear. So what we did is we took all of the U.S. air um, markets and we overlaid them with the American Airlines market and we came up with 761 one-stop flights which overlapped. At that time, um, the GAO also did a similar study and their study was released today and it shows even a more dramatic overlapping. They come up with 1,600 uh, something. And their study then is based upon more than one stop, maybe a two stop connection and so on. That's how they ended up with more. So the way you look at how network airlines compete with each other is from destination to destination, not hub to hub, not nonstop routes. And so uh, when you look at that, in our study, we came up with 40% of the current American airline routes are covered by US air routes and 30% of the current American airline route or U.S. air routes are covered by American airline routes because U.S. air has a bigger domestic market. And that's the best way to look at it. And that shows real competition in the market, uh, not necessarily only looking at the nonstop routes. Okay. Is that clear? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. The, Dr. Dillingham, what do you think about this approach that the Consumer Travel Alliance did? Um, I, I, we haven't actually analyzed, you know, how, how he did his work or how the Consumer uh, Travel Alliance did their work. But I would say, just to be clear on what the GAO did say, yes, we said there were 1,600, uh, you know, overlapping routes. But we also said that there was uh, a competitor, uh, another competitor on those routes as well. So I think, and, and I think the other point that, that we would make is that, uh, is our understanding that as DOJ and, and the FAA look through the merger that they will uh, uh, have a comprehensive analysis more along the lines of not just nonstop, but also where there are overlapping routes. So uh, I, I think, again, as we said before, it, 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 a lot is yet to be determined, uh, but clearly those kinds of issues will be addressed, that we believe, through DOJ and uh, DOT. Okay, I have another question, Mr. Leoka, about just ticket price transparency. I mean, there's nothing the consumer <laughs> cares about more than this ticket price. And over the last few years, the you know fees and ancillary charges have grown dramatically from about 1.7 billion in 2002 to 9.1 billion in, tw in 2012. So um, shouldn't these ancillary fees be uh, a little more in lockstep and what do you think DOJ should look at that as far as the merger? Well, I would like DOJ to look at that in part, as part of the merger. However, I don't think that falls under their jurisdiction. Um, I uh, talked with Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation is currently has a rulemaking which is at um, OMB right now. Uh, and what we need, what we're, we've been trying to do, and I've spent even more time doing this than I have been looking at slots, um, is it was, uh, we're trying to get the airlines to disclose their ancillary fees at the time that we buy our airline tickets. Right now, if we buy our airline tickets from a travel agency, and that will be from an Expedia or an Orbitz or from a corporate travel agency, we don't know what the, how much the baggage is gonna cost us. We don't know how much uh, seat reservations are gonna cost. And then there are a lot of other fees that go in there. But what I'm concerned with are the fees, baggage fees and seat reservation fees so that Consumers can compare prices, and especially if we end up with a merger coming through, which is wringing competition out of the system, there has to be a way that consumers can bring, can at least have an ability to comparison shop for tickets with everything together and look at oranges and oranges. And so that's what we've been trying to do. I, I think we're getting close to it. However, it's a, it's a long process to bring, um, to bring this thing through to fruition. And that's what consumers really need. Otherwise, we have no way to really compare the prices. Ms. Curlin, is this under your jurisdiction or is that someone else at DOT? It's part of DOT, it's part of the general counsel's office, but I, I can get back to you. Okay, I know this is of great interest to lots of people and long time in coming, so. 
Well, I think we've uh, had an airing of the issues here. I think we've raised some important questions. Uh, we'll keep the record open for two weeks for the rest of our colleagues to ask questions, and if you'll respond uh, to them. This is uh, uh, a very important issue, and I hope that uh, the appropriate agencies take due notice of the issues that were raised here today and try to address them before this moves forward.